Hey, we're live here on a Wednesday night. I want to thank you for subscribing, tuning in to Aired Out. Uh, brought to you by Gothier's Quality Grounds and Maintenance. Jason Gothier is a super, super busy guy right now uh, this time of year. Out plowing, getting ready for the uh, spring landscaping. Chris Wright from Wright Electric Project Independence and a new presenting sponsor tonight, which I am so excited about. Uh, Lauren over at Aeromed Essentials. What a great lady she is. Uh, we've got uh, so much to tell you about them, but three locations now. Berlin Mall, of course, uh, State Street in Montpelier, and now over in Hanover. We are very excited. Uh, she's going to be on the show. Can't be soon enough. I can't wait to have her on. She's a great lady. Lauren Andrews, uh, thanks for being uh, our new presenting sponsor here on Aired Out. I have with me a guy that I've been looking forward to having on this show for a very long time, Dave Keller. My man, welcome. Thanks, JD. It's good I'm to so, see you, man. I'm I, glad to be here. I'm so thrilled that you're here. Brother, where do we start? Where do we begin with you? You're you're an interesting dude. Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean no more interesting than anyone else. Well, I just happen to play guitar. Oh, uh, no, no, no. That That is not true. You're an interesting, interesting guy and a remarkably talented uh, life got started for you, the first 11 in Worcester, Mass. Yep. And then uh, you you did what? You cut loose at some point and you ran around the country. Yeah, I was traveling all over before I moved to Vermont. I was out in uh, Washington State right before I moved here. I was a VISTA volunteer, uh, kind of before they had AmeriCorps. They called it VISTA. Yeah. So what'd yeah. you do? What'd yeah, you do? I uh, worked with low-income families, helping them figure out ways to save heat and electric. How'd and, you land that gig? Uh, my girlfriend at the time and I, we worked for an environmental consulting company outside Boston and it was just horribly boring and just mind killing. Yeah. Writing EPA reports in like a cubicle, hermetically sealed building. Uh, you know, the high point of my day was like going to get like a sandwich at like the gas station store next door. We're already off to a, uh, a great start. You and I are, are, <laughs> are, are so similar because I, I was actually uh, working at ITT Hartford Life Insurance. Wow. In Hartford, I can't Connecticut. Actually doing that. No. 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 In yeah. right in Hartford, Connecticut. But then Where again, is you know, Wallace Stevens, like one of the great American poets. Didn't he work in an insurance company in Hartford or something for years know. and years and wrote poems on the side, I think? I don't know, but, but now I'm going to have to. A lot of poets <laughs> probably stuck working in insurance and environmental I, consulting. You know, you know? I just got to the point where I'm like, you know, the whole suit and tie thing and briefcase mm -hmm. in a cubicle with a little headset on, I'm out of here. It's for some people. Like, I don't, of course. I don't like, um, you know, I don't want to dump on it, you know. Sure. And it's good that there are people willing to do those jobs because, honestly, that kind of work needs to get done. Yeah. You know, like, we can't all, like, play guitar and do sure. radio shows, you know. Sure. The, war, the economy would come to a grinding halt, right? So what happened after that? Um, You're running around. Yeah, you, so I was you, working for that consulting company, and just, like, my girlfriend and I were like, God, we need a change. So we signed up to be AmeriCorps volunteers, and I think, you know, we basically – Got like subsistence wages, uh, you know, enough to basically r rent a little teeny place way out in the sticks in northeast Washington, wow. up north of Spokane, about an hour and a half, up by the Canadian border, the Idaho Panhandle, up that way. And uh, yeah, I spent my days driving way out in the country to visit single moms mostly, and uh, you know, just kind of explain to them how they might save a little money because they were all just living so close to the bone. You know? Wow. And it was really cool. And then after a while, I realized that uh, it was totally inefficient to drive to like one house at a time. So I came up with this thing called Energy Wear Parties, kind of like Tupperware. And Get I got, out I got of the town. local food shelf to donate like cookies and juice and stuff. And we'd have one of the people would host a little party at their house. They'd invite all their friends. And I'd teach them all, you know, how to save energy, you know, and like uh, hit like 10 instead of, you know, for the price of one kind of thing, you know. That is so and wild. And then I got the local utility to donate like, uh, uh, you know, wraps for their hot water heaters or things to turn your th thermostat down automatically, things like that. So everybody walked away with something, too. So it was really Did, cool. Were you moving your way back east? Did not you say? Yet. No, not at that point. I was just out there for a year. It was a year kind of um, pro program. You know, I was there for a year. And at the end of the year, my girlfriend and I decided to, like, take a big sabbatical. And I wanted to move back east, be a little closer to my family. They were all in Massachusetts mostly. My grandparents were getting older. And I didn't want to live, like, you know, where I could only see them once a year. You yeah. Know? So I... Uh, Packed everything up in my car, my dog, dropped my girlfriend off in Ohio, where she was from, and kept driving. And I had a list of towns I thought might be cool, uh, places where there might be other young people. I was about 25 at So the you time. broke up with a girlfriend? This is back in 93. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we broke up. Had all my stuff in my car with my old dog, Hickory. Uh, so maybe some people out there listening might remember Hickory. And, uh, yeah, we just drove around, like, from West Virginia, Northern Virginia, all the way up through Pennsylvania, upstate New York. 
checked out different places in Vermont. And then I was driving through Montpelier on a sunny late December day back in 90, 92 it was, at the end of 92. And I just fell in love with Montpelier. It seemed like a cool place. There was Book Spieler, so it was a oh record God, store. And of course. There was Guitar Sam, which at the time was played against Sam. Yes. Right? When they were all building before it burned. Yeah, with Kevin still. Kevin Cross Kevin. is still running it. Yeah. He's holding it down. He's awesome. What a great dude. Yeah, he's a great supporter of all of us. Local sure he is. You know? Sure. I'm grateful for him. And, and Charlie uh, O's. And then Charlie O's was there. I thought, well, a blues bar, that's cool. I needed to be somewhere where I could play blues. At that point, I was totally in love with blues already, and I was like, wherever I, be, wherever I am, I have to be able to play blues. So Charlie O's was a great place to play with a band, and then at the time, there was the Pyralisk, back by where the Mount Pelee Police Station is now. Uh, there's Zuri, the little salon back there next to it. Um, that building was the Pyralisk, where Nicholas Hecht, great artist, and uh, I don't know what you'd call him, like impresario, he had this little space, which was, he did, there was, there was music, there was poetry, there was art, um, you know, he, his art was in there, and there were just different happenings, you know, it was kind of like a little hippie coffee house. How the hell did you get through the catch net of Burlington and, and penetrate through there and end up in Montpelier? Well, I'll tell you why, because, you know, Burlington was on my list, actually, because you know, it was a college town, I thought, well, that'd be cool, be young people and, you know. Wicked arts, yeah. But there were pe too many people honking horns up there, man. I was like, <laughs> I'd been living in a town of about, oh, I don't know, 1,200 people. And the big town around there was 5,000 people. Yeah. And I was like, boy, I don't know if I can handle 40,000. That's just a little too big. So then what? So you settled down? Yeah, so I rented a place uh, up on Guyette Road up in North Montpelier um, for a few months, and I got a job as a temp. I was a Kelly girl. And that's what they used to call them back when, like, temporary services were mostly secretaries. Yeah, like Kelly and, services. And receptionists. They, called, they called them Kelly girls if you worked for Kelly services, right? Yeah. So I was a Kelly girl up at uh, Johnson State College for, like, a long-term one for, like, uh, six weeks. And I would drive up every day to Johnson, and by the time I got to Johnson, it was always snowing. And, yeah. you know, and then I'd get home and I'd go out in town in Montpelier and poke around. But I couldn't find like a permanent job around here. So I finally ended up getting a job working for Community Action in St. Albans and uh, running food shelves and doing outreach uh, assistance for you know, uh, food stamp outreach, heating assistance, uh, landlord tenant eviction stuff for low income folks. And that was really satisfying. I really liked that. And I lived in Burlington while I you know, would commute up to St. Albans. So if you were living in Burlington, how much? How much playing in Burlington were you doing? Well, I started playing out pretty soon after. Right after? There. Yeah. I had is, this is guitar. That... This was the guitar that I used. It was this is old Yamaha from the 70s. It's my first and only acoustic guitar. I haven't bought any since. Did you get I right got into... a bunch of electric guitars, but just this I'm guitar. sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Do you, do you, is that where you, you got into Nectars right off? No, it took me a while to get into Nectars, man. Yeah. You can't just step foot and you yeah. know, walk right into Nectars and get a gig. Right. Um, Joe Moore got me into Nectars. Do you know Joe? No, no. You don't know Joe Moore? No. You got to get Joe Moore on the show, okay? Joe Moore. Promise me that. I will. He is the musician with the best resume in Vermont. He played with Wilson Pickett. Okay. At all the great black theaters all over the country. The Apollo, right. the Howard, the Regal. He played in the heyday of Pickett's career, like Mustang Sally, Land of a Thousand Dances, you know, Midnight Hour. He played with Pickett. He was from Florida. He toured with him, like, a lot. So where's he hanging out now? He lives now? in Burlington. He's oh. been in Burlington forever. He plays with X-Rays. He played with Pork Tornado, uh, John Fishman's side project. Um, yeah, he's a great sax player. The best. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's a great guy. You should have him in. He'd be, he'd be tell some fun stories. All right. It, yeah. I'll, I'll reach out to him. Yeah, yeah, I'll connect you. For, for, please, but please so, yeah, do. Joe Moore, basically. So I'll tell you the story how I got to get Nectars, because this is kind of crazy. This tells you how old school things were back then. This was like in 96 when I started my band. My first three years in Vermont, 93 to 96, I just did solo gigs. Yeah. I played like the Last Elm up in Burlington, Last Elm Cafe. Um, before there was City Market, the grocery store, yep. there was this little cafe called City Market where Zabby Stone Soup is on College Street, okay. Church Street. I used to play in there um, with Patty Casey, oh, Gagnon, God. Patty Casey. Matt McGibney. They used to do a little trio thing on Sundays. I'd go in there and play harmonica with them for a free breakfast. You know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I played the open mics there. I got started with open mics, and there was a woman, Laura Simon, who lives down in Wilder, Vermont, and we would split gigs. We didn't have enough songs, e either of us, for a full gig. So I'd play like, you know, seven or eight tunes and she'd play seven or eight tunes, you know. I'd back her up on guitar for her tunes and blues stuff, you know. Now, back in Montpelier, yeah. I, I'm just w wondering here, did you ever, did you ever uh, do anything with Diane Ziegler? You know, I never did. I, I've seen, we've sat, stopped and chat on the sidewalk, but she has, I think by the time I was doing more stuff and would have run into her, she was kind of dialing back and raising kids. Yeah, think, so. yes, that's right. Zig's, yeah. Zig's amazing. That's man. what everybody says. I yeah. have yet to see her, but I mean, I hear only great things. Yeah. Like, she's amazing, apparently. Wow. 
Yeah. So so then what? So you you got the band together. Yeah. Late, so I started a band in '96. Yeah. And my first regular gig was at Manhattan Pizza, right at the base of Church oh Street. Oh my God! Yes. Back when Phil and um, Phil and Nancy Kuna, the ran original the place. owners. Yeah. They both yeah. passed away from cancer. It was really sad. But they were great, and they would hire me, 200 bucks and all the pizza and beer we wanted. I played in there. <laughs> it's a good we, deal, man. It was a good deal, all right? I'd play there like every other week, you know. And uh, my bass player was Nato, Nate Orshan from Essex. Yeah. He used to be in a band called The Cuts back in the 90s, early 90s in Burlington. Kind of a new wave band. And then Jay Gleason on drums, who had just moved up from, a glo uh, well, he's originally from Gloversville, New York. He had lived out in Idaho playing uh, drums with John Namath, who is a huge blues star now. Um, wow. And Jay's now my drummer again after like a 20-year gap. He was played with me for about three years and... Uh, and then um, took a break, and then he just started playing with me again a couple years ago. He's on my new record. That's awesome. Let's talk about some of these records, <laughs> man. Let, well, I didn't let, get to tell you the Nectar story. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, please tell me All Nectar's. Right. So I'll make it. I'll make it quick. But uh, basically, I walked into Nectar's, you know, and then Nectar was upstairs, you know, and he said, "Oh, come with me, you know, come to my office." So we go downstairs, and you, know, you go past all the the crates of empty beer bottles, and you know, and. It's it's like a. Uh, I've heard I've heard he's like, like he's like the Godfather when you, when you. Oh, it was crazy. It was like. It was like just this maze downstairs underneath Nectar's, you know, yeah. and it was dingy and dark and a little sketchy. And you finally get to Nectar's desk way at the back end, you know, in the basement. And there's all these stacks of cassette tapes, you know, because this is pre-CDs, yes. really. I mean, CDs yep. were out, but they were out, musicians but... weren't making CDs unless they had a record deal. Right. So, uh, so I said, wow, you know, you know, it must be hard for you to listen to all these. You know, how do you decide, like, who to hire? How do you li possibly listen to all these cassettes? He's like, oh, oh, I don't listen to any of them. Joe Moore said you're good. Oh. And that was it. Joe had said I was good, so that got wow. me in the door. Wow. So I have Joe Moore to thank, yeah. It's not what you know, too, you know. I, I think in Vermont it's especially that way. Yeah. I was talking to a friend about this the other day, and I was saying, you know, the, the great thing about Vermont is word of mouth is everything. Sure, sure it is. So if you're, like, a nice person and you work hard and right. you're decent at what you do, you don't have to be great. You're decent. You can get out there sure. and work, you know? Yeah. People will, people will tell the people about you, and they'll start coming to your shows. I started with five fans. In 1996, at Manhattan Pizza, there were there were four people who were uh, it was two gynecologists and two people who worked in their office, and there was this other guy Ken Kiefer who used to come, and he he's one of my greatest friends now. Yeah, and the five of them started coming to my gigs, and then it kind of built from there. Ken Kiefer, um, he's the one I sold that um, that turquoise guitar to. It was more of that a, we were just talking about. Yeah, aqua. It was like an aqua guitar. Uh, strap. Yeah, and and Ken. Um, uh, Jason Gothier uh, just sent me a text a minute mm -hmm. ago. Ask him if he's if he's still playing with Ken Kiefer. Really? Yeah. Well, that's kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah, Ken's great. He's involved with. Um, he married Susanna of Susanna's Catering, um, yeah. up in uh, Johnson. Wow. And she's great. She's one of the best chefs. Everybody I know. And, freaking yeah, knows everybody. And that's the thing, though. See, if if I had stayed, you know, if I'd gone back to Boston area and tried to make it down there as a blues guy, there were a zillion blues guys down there. I would have gotten cut to pieces and left in the in the gutter, man. You know, right. I wasn't that good. Sure. Sure. I didn't start out good. One of the questions that I'm so curious about, and we have to talk about your incredible albums and what you've been nominated for and the brand new one out, but I just got to ask him, yeah, my, yeah. my brother. Please, yeah. Uh oh How, Watch how out. many, please, how many pairs of shoes do you have? <laughs> Do do so. I, I, I guess did not it, see that coming, Jay. I did not see that coming. Do you have as many pairs of shoes as Chad Hollister has glasses? Well, I don't know how many he has. He has a lot of pairs of glasses. Oh my god! That's because he's friends with Pete Boyle, who runs well, Optical Expression. Well, Optical Pete's, Expression. Pete, Pete sold it, but um, but yeah. yeah he, my um, God, my man! Yeah. It's like every time I see you, there's a different pair of shoes on. Every time hey, I have see you, seen these? Can I hold these up? Yeah, please, Look please. Okay, you see them? There we are. Are we on the TV? No, not really. Not really? Yeah. No, take, take them off. There you go. Those yeah, are my good ones. It's not bad. Give me one of those shoes. No, nah, man. you got to go to Illinois to get those. <laughs> Come on. What's the obsession with the shoes? Well, it's I mean, fun. It's fun. You know, it's just fun. I mean, I was always a really conservative dresser, to be honest, for years and years and years. And then when I started playing music more seriously, I was like, you know, why am I dressing so conservative? Let's have yeah. some fun with it, you know? Yeah. And it's also a way of connecting to the... Kind of the blues culture, I guess, you know, where the blues comes from. It, you know, it, yes. And, you know, you see a lot of rock bands dress up in jeans and a T-shirt. But you see a lot of rock bands dress up in a jeans and a T-shirt. But in the blues, people always dressed, you know. Yeah. You know, I mean, especially in the black community, it was it would be considered disrespectful to show up on a stage in jeans and a T-shirt. I saw you. In work boots or, yeah, or right. Birkenstocks or whatever. I, I was on my bands for a long time about, please do not wear that stuff on stage. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I saw you somewhere late 90s, uh, might have been 2000, and right after the gig, I was talking with somebody, and I, God knows who it was, but they were like, what color shoes did he have on? <laughs> And, and I, I didn't get the memo that that uh, I, you know that I was going to see a guy with some ass kicking shoes, wow. so I walked in. I'm like, oh my god, this guy's unbelievable! And look at his freaking shoes. Yeah. And well, you have to come over someday, JD, and I'll show you my shoe collection. I want to see a picture of the shoe collection. No, no, that, that's private, man. <laughs> but they, they were I don't like, I don't do that stuff on Instagram. Sorry, I don't I don't reveal everything. They, they were like, what color shoes was he? And I was like, oh my god, you so. You know about Dave Keller and his shoes? And I, I said they, they were pink. There you go. They were like a pink, like a... Probably a lavender. Like a lavender. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I actually need some bright pink ones. I don't have any bright pink ones, but that's on my list. <laughs> oh, God. I've got almost every color of the rainbow at this point. Let's talk about some of these albums, brother. And, sure. it, you yeah. know, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, th th let's talk about the latest one here sure. that just came out. Yeah. Hit me. Let me know. Uh, yeah, my first live CD ever. Ever. It's called Live at the Killer Guitar Thriller. And I was not intending to release a CD, to be honest. Literally, um, a guy recorded a gig down in Pennsylvania last April just from the crowd and approached me after the show and said, Hey, you know, I, I, I hope you don't mind. I recorded it. Um, I said, Oh, that's cool. You know, I'd love to hear it. He's like, Cool, I can put it on a CD and send it to you. So, you know, a few weeks later, I get a CD in the mail. And, you know, this happens, like, you know, semi-regularly. People send me recordings or photos or whatever, and I'm always like, it's nice, you know, but I don't really ever figure I'll use most of it, you know, and especially a CD. Like, you know, what's the chances the audio quality is going to be any good or that even that it was a good performance? A lot of times it's right. like an average performance. Well, I'm not going to do much with an average performance. It's nice to listen to, like, in a Monday morning quarterback kind of way, right? But Sure. But I popped it in my CD player, and I was like, Wow. That's really good, you know, and I knew it was a good gig. Like, we had driven all the way down to uh, just outside Philly in Bucks County, a little town called Edgeley, and it was at a VFW hall and uh, put on by a blues society, the oldest blues society in the country. It's called Bucks County Blues Society. They've been there since 1977. These are, like, old-school, diehard blues and soul people. Like, they, I think they were, like, all motorcycle guys maybe originally. They're all kind of, like, gruff. I don't know. They all have that, like, that, like, Jersey, Philly, oh, yeah. Delaware kind of gruff sure, thing in their sure. voice, but they're sweethearts. They're all like yeah. little softies. Um, but at first they come off as a little bit like tough, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but they were like, they hired us to be the headliner for this event. It was called the Killer Guitar Thriller. There were two other bands before us. And so we drove down for the gig. Uh, Jay Gleason and Alex Budney, great bass player out of Moortown, Vermont. He yeah. plays with uh, Seth Chad's McAvon. been telling me about him. Oh, he's great. I don't tell anyone on TV, though, please, man. I want to play more with him, and he's already too busy to get him on all my gigs. Oh, you know? ouch. So forget, forget Alex Budney's name. Please, all right, I will. do not hire him. For I'm not going to say Alex okay. Budney again. No, please, all right. We won't. All right, so, uh, but yeah, so the three of us drove down there, had you know, and just had a great killer gig. So, and it, it was obvious from listening to the, the CD the guy sent me, and I was like, wow, you know, and the more I listened to it, I kept, like, listening to it. I'd pop in the car, I'd be like, oh, I throw that in the car and listen to it while I'm driving to a gig. And I was like, wow, that's really good. And then I play it for my girlfriend, and she was like, yeah, that's really good. And I played it for, like, Johnny Rawls. He's like, you should put this out. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, you should put it out, like, right away. Don't wait. It's really good. It sounds like what you sound like. The, you could tell the crowd's into it. The grooves are great. It's great energy. Yeah, you, you should put this out. So I, I was like, my record company, Cat, it's not my record company, but the, the record, the last record that I put out was on Cat Food Records out of El Paso. Yeah. And they didn't want to do something right away. They wanted to kind of like wait a little bit. So I was like, well, in the meantime, let me put this out on my own label, Tasty Tone. Which, okay. which you've had for a while. Yeah, I put started. out a lot of records of my own. Yeah. 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 So that's just that's the nature of really cool. building a career, man. You know? So what did you do to it? Did you, did you tweak it? Well, this is the thing. You'll appreciate this, all right? So it's not a board recording. This is a guy who was 20 feet out in the crowd with a stereo microphone on a stand, you know? And so there's no mixing. You can't mix it. There's only one track, right? There's no fixing anything because you can't like pull the vocals down or pull the guitar up or anything like that. You can't replace any of the guitar solos. You can't fix a bad note. None of that. So literally, I brought it to Lane Gibson at um, Lane Gibson Recording and Mastering out in um, Charlotte, where I did my previous record uh, a couple of albums back, right back at you, with my Vermont band uh, back in 2016. I brought it to Lane and said, hey, you know, what can we do with this? And he's like, well, let me listen to it. He's like, Don't tell me he said nothing. No, he said 98% of the time, you know, recordings like this are totally unusable for, for one reason or another. There's some kind of background thing or it's just the mix is off. But he's like, the mix sounds good. 
the volume, the levels are good. He boosted it five decibels, the whole thing overall. He said the it was a little louder in the left channel than the right channel. There's nothing you could do about it. It wasn't that big a deal. He's like, you got really, really lucky. Like, really yeah, lucky. that's crazy. So we just edited out some of my talking in between songs, you know, because I was just chatting a little too much. And uh, we got it down to where it fits on a CD. I mean, you can't go over 80 minutes or the integrity is not guaranteed at the factory. So this is 70. No, you can't go over 78 minutes. It's 77 minutes and 52 seconds. So people are getting their money's worth on this one. That's 15 fantastic. songs. And it's our whole set. I didn't leave any songs out. Yeah. Yep. Wow. The only thing I cut out was a little dialogue. That's it. Monologue, I should say. Let's. So this this just came out just, yeah, yeah, like just what, a few weeks uh, ago? Yeah, just February 9th was my CD release. All right. Yeah. So Book Spieler's got it. Yeah, I just dropped some off, and I'm going to drop some off with Sandy at Exile on Main Street. Okay, what a great lady. Next week. Uh, probably this, later this week, actually. Yeah. God bless them all for still running the vinyl, and, and just, just they're just great people. Yeah, I love going to hang out in record stores. I, I, hope, I, things. I hope we're always going to have record stores. Me too, me too. So you can get it there. Yeah. Uh, and you can get it online at davekeller.com. That's simple. That's my online store is through Bandcamp, and the link's right on my website, just at, if you go to the store link. Soul Changes. 2013. Yeah. Tell me the story about that. That was uh, popularly known as the divorce album. The divorce album. That was. <laughs> <laughs> it's that strange. Was, That's the most popular one. I sold out of that one. That was a tough time. Go and figure. you, you yeah. did a little uh, online funding, right? Yeah, that was a Kickstarter. Yep. I did a Kickstarter campaign for that. I had over 200 people gave me money to make that happen. So How'd that feel? I went down to Memphis and recorded that. That's what that paid for. It felt amazing, man. It was like a giant group hug. I'd, I'd never asked my fans for really much of anything, to be honest, you know, other than to show up at a gig occasionally and clap, you know. Why Memphis? I had a producer from the previous record, Bob Perry. He's a guy that produced, um, well, a lot of people. Wu-Tang Clan, Brian McKnight, uh, Foxy Brown, like sort of hip-hop kind of urban artists. He was the guy who discovered 50 Cent. 50 Cent, yeah. Maybe I'm not saying it right. No, you cent? are. Fitty. Fitty Cent, right? Fitty Cent. See, I know something. I don't entirely live in a cave. <laughs> Just part time in a cave, <laughs> but um, yeah. So he produced all those guys, and he produced my album "Where I'm Coming From" in 2012. Uh, used a band called The Revelations out of Brooklyn, and that won the International Blues Challenge Award for best self-release CD. He had some horns. Yeah, we had some badass. Oh, excuse me, uh, really awesome horns. You can say badass. I can. Oh yeah, of course you can. Okay, we had some badass horns. And the Brooklyn Horns, I think they were called. Anyways, it, it was a great album. It did really well. It won the International Blues Challenge. And then uh, I said well, I said to Bob, my producer, I said, well, what are we going to do for the next one, man? How are we going to top this? He's like, well, let's do it in Memphis. And let's um, not only do it in Memphis, let's do it at, he had a connection at, at a Royal Recording, which wow. is the studio where High Records was based, H-I, if you look that up online, High Records, that was the home to Al Green. So Love and Happiness, Let's Stay Together, all oh those great hits, Let's Get Married. Uh, Ann Peebles, I Can't Stand the Rain, you know, her great hit. And people like Otis Clay, Syl Johnson, who's still around. Um, O.V. Wright, my, one of my favorite top three singers of all time. O.V. Wright, amazing, deep soul singer. How'd you feel when you walked in there? Oh, man, I was just, uh, like, glowing, I guess. Like, just, like, the whole place looked like it really was still 1974. It had, you know, the, the carpet on the walls, the shag carpet, and the, everything was in avocado green and that uh, dusky kind of orange. Do you, ever, do, do you ever walk into some of these studios and just be a little intimidated? Oh, for sure, for sure. But the cool thing about this place, and you can see why they're so successful over the years, they still had the high rhythm section there, the same rhythm section that Al Green used and all these other artists used. These guys were in their late 60s. They're still, like on retainer to work there. And uh, so they were just so 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 relaxed themselves. It's a Southern vibe. Like, like I'm not like a real relaxed person. Anyone who knows me knows I got a lot of energy. I'm kind of hyper, you know, fast talking. I, mean, I grew up in Massachusetts. It's yeah. like kind of in my culture, you know, I'm Jewish on top of it. Yeah. So I got that like urban Jewish, you know, Massachusetts thing. I yeah. can't like calm down too much. <laughs> you know, people in Vermont, it's like when I first moved up here, I remember they were like, well, let's, let's wait and see if we like this guy, you know, because, you know, that energy can be a little abrasive sometimes. Like, wow. I'm not a jerk. Like, I try to be a nice guy. But the energy, people have different energies from where they are. So the people down in Memphis, man, they're chill. Yeah. It's not a rush, you know. They're, and they were supportive, man, those guys. Someone described it to me as, uh, you know, when you go in there and you play with a high rhythm section and, and, 
the son of the original producer who produced all that great stuff, um, the son, uh, Willie Mitchell, his son Boo Mitchell is the producer now down there and the engineer. They said Boo will make you feel like you just like, you just fell into like uh, a big pile of like the softest pillows in the world, like a pit just wow. with pillows and feathers, you know. And was it was true. I felt really relaxed, you know. And yeah. what about when you came home? Was the soul changed? How were you when you came home? Hmm. Eyes wider than. Yeah, it gave me a sense of confidence for sure, that part of it, you know, to be able to go down there and bring my songs to these guys, play them on my guitar, show them how they go, give them the charts, and then have them play them and really like them and put their heart and soul into them and have them come out really well. Um, and, I mean, another thing while I was down there was, uh, there's a whole other part of it, is that I got to co-write with this guy, Daryl Carter, who wrote Woman's Gotta Have It with Bobby Womack, which, if your listeners, viewers don't know that song, I don't know what cave they're living in, but in my cave, we listen to Bobby Womack. And uh, <laughs> so I don't mean to offend anyone, but just no. go check it out. Woman's Gotta Have It. It's a, it's a classic soul tune. And Daryl Carter and I wrote a tune together down there called 17 Years. So that was the centerpiece of the album. Um, and that's the song everybody wants to hear when I play it, play out. You know, they're all like, oh, you know, can you play 17 Years? Or, you know, is it on that record? Which record's it on, you know? Do you get tired of it? No, man. It's, it's, it's intense, man. It's a heavy song because I was with my ex-wife. You know, we were together for 17 years. We yeah. did this together, you know, and it all kind of fell apart. And uh, I told Daryl that when I walked in the studio that morning and we were going to sit down to write a song together. He's like, well, what, what ideas did you bring down? What do, what, do you got, what do you got going on, you know? I'm like, well, I didn't bring anything. He's like, well, what's going on in your life, son? I said, well, you know, my, my ex-wife, you know, like, uh, she, you know, she, my wife left me after. We were together for 17 years. And he goes, well, that sounds like a good song. 17 years. Let's start there. Holy shit. So, yeah, so we wrote the song in about 40 minutes. Went out to lunch, a little soul food buffet. Came, ho came back to the studio. Oh, we, we, well, we wrote it. Then I recorded it with the band. Then Daryl and I went out to lunch. Came back from lunch. Who was in the studio but Bobby Blue Bland? Now, Bobby Blue Bland is one of the greatest singers of all time. I mean, I don't, that's not an exaggeration. Right up there with, uh, you know, I don't know, Elvis or, uh, you know, the Beatles. I don't know. Who, who would you put up there? Aretha? What would you do? Bobby Blue Bland. Uh, well, so I introduced myself to him, first of all. I asked if it was okay. I asked his valet. You know, these guys have valets. So I said, excuse me, you know, do you think I could have a word with Mr. Bland? And he said, oh, of course, go ahead, you know. And Bobby Blue Bland, he was like 84 at the time, and he was pretty weak you know he was kind of on the way out it was sad to see and his voice was real quiet and i got down on my knee you know and he was sitting on the little leather sofa and then in the lounge i said excuse me mr bland but you know i just gotta say i'm a huge fan of yours and you know i love you know so many of your songs and the california album is great you know there's so many songs and he's like oh well, thank you thank you son thank you and uh, he's like what are you doing here you know i'm like well i'm making a record he's like oh well, can I hear some of it? I was like, well, uh, you'd have, we'd have to go in the studio. You know, he's like, well, uh, can you sing some? And so I was like, oh, my God. Damn. Bobby Blue Bland's asking me to sing to him, like a cappella. Like, well, how am I going to do this? So I just did. I'm mean, like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to say no, you know. So I was like, I sang a little bit of the chorus of 17 years, you know. I was like, uh, 17 years of heartache. Seventeen years of pain Seventeen years of love And it all went down the drain You know, something like that. I didn't have a guitar, I man. I just sang it like, you know. Can, can you keep going? Just bring that mic down just a little oh, yeah? bit. Just a little bit more. Uh, if, 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 if sure, you can, I'll if you would. Song. You want to hear the whole song? I want to hear the whole thing, man. Seventeen years ago, baby Age-old story Everybody tells Starts out in heaven Winds up in hell Don't it, baby 
Took 17 years for me to find out a whole lot of things I know nothing about. Lord, that's the truth. 17 years of heartache. 17 years of pain. 17 years of love. Oh, I went down the drain. Started out a terrific love affair. I was in love with the very idea of you being there. What a rude awakening when I found out somebody else you were dreaming about. Now my dream is over. Hard working years, loving you, girl, fighting back tears. Now, all I can say is goodbye. 17 years of heartache, 17 years of pain, 17 years of love, and it all went down the drain. Dude, my phone's blowing up here. I got people, Ouch. people texting me right you now. Me, man, saying, you play those oh songs. my God, this is incredible. Oh, really? Brother. Thanks, man. I'm, I'm honored. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening, people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so people, I play that song yeah. for him, right? Like, well, I play that little bit. And he said, Oh, you, you sound good, son. You sound good. You got a nice voice. And then he was there actually for a photo shoot, you know, so they went and took his photo. Then Bobby Blue Bland, you know, is like done with the photo. And I'm like, Well, I gotta ask him to come hear the re the real recording. I'm like, Mr. Bland, would you want to come and hear what we did? You know, Good come, for and, you. come into the studio. And so he said, he said, yes, I would. So the valet gave me like the the hairy eyeball. Oh, He's like, yeah. oh, you know, this is not gonna be easy, you know, because he was using a walker, you know. Like I said, he was 84 or so. So the valet had him on one end, and I had him behind him, and we kind of got him ever so slowly over all the chords and up the slope because there's an old movie theater the studio's in. And we get him about all, you know, 25 feet or whatever it is into the studio. And I'm, the whole time I'm thinking, man, if you he gotta, falls, yeah, I drop him, he falls, and he dies, everybody's going to be like, that Dave white, Keller that white killed boy him. from Vermont killed Bobby Blue Bland. <laughs> yeah. And that's it. I'll be like the Bill Buckner of the blues, man. <laughs> it's, I will, it will, I'll live in infamy. I'll die. I mean, it'll be horrible. I'd have to, like, go hide out. So but we got him in there, and they listened to the song. They played it back through the studio monitors, and the whole time he's listening. He's like, listen, and I could hear him singing a little bit, like in this high voice, along with my, my voice, you know? Whoa. I'm like, what is he doing? And then the whole time, I'm just like, you know, 
close to about half the distance between you and I from, from him. And after the song, I'm thinking, okay, this is the moment of truth. Like, what's he going to say, you know? He's like, you're going to sing that again, son, right? And I'm like, well, I wasn't planning on it. I didn't say that. But I thought, well, sure, sure, I'll sing it again, you know. It was, it was a, um, you usually do a rough vocal anyways, you know, when you overdub sure. it later for a lot of studio stuff. So I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I was going to sing it again. He's like, well, when you do, sing it like this. Uh -oh. And he taught me how to sing it, you know, with like emphasizing the 17. 17 really? years, the years, the years. That was it, emphasizing the years, you know. So I did my best on it, you know. And, wow. and then people like the song, you know, it resonates with a lot of people. A lot of people have been through that kind of thing, you know. How many people out there have not, you know, had a long-term relationship that came to an end, you know. If you haven't, I guess you're lucky. Either that or you're living in misery, one of the two. But, yeah. You know, most people have had some serious heartbreak at some point or another in their lives. You get to be our age, right? So that put some that puts some serious wind in the sail for you. Yeah, to have Bobby Blue Bland kind of give me his seal of approval and the high rhythm high rhythm section guys like my songs and and you know, and then it got nominated for a Blues Music Award, which is the highest award you can get in the blues field um, in the soul and blues. That's world. kind of the, it's kind like, of like a Grammy. Like, like one step below the Grammys. Yeah, because you know in the Grammys they only have like two awards for the whole blues and soul field. It's kind of ridiculous. So the blues people started their own awards about forty years ago. It used to be called the Handy Awards. It's now called the Blues Music Awards. And I think I read somewhere there's like 125 people that are that are skimming through that. Yeah, yeah. There's and like uh, the the nominators, I guess they call them. Yeah. And so they, it, so it's it's super. Oh, and it's yeah, it's objective. DJs, yeah, booking agents, club owners, you name it. You know, record label people. Wow. So yeah, to be nominated was a huge honor. I was pretty excited about it. I'm so, so excited about it. So a couple of years off. Yeah. After after that, after and, soul changes, yeah. And then what? Uh, yeah, then I did my record in Vermont with my band because my producer Bob Perry he didn't want to use my band. He wanted to use Studio Guys, which worked fine. It was great and all that. But I was like itching to use my band, and you know this was I right to show back off at their you? talents. Yeah, so I did right back at you up at Lane Gibson's studio in Charlotte with Ira Friedman on keys, Brett Hoffman from up in the Kingdom on on Dude, drums. My Ira is just he you is an, he's an animal on yeah. the Hammond, right? Oh my God! Yeah, I mean B three and horns. Yeah, Imagine. it has to go with with Dave Keller. Yeah, you've you've got such a fantastic foundation. Thanks, man. So go ahead. I, I interrupted. No, no, it's fine. No, so Ira's great. Yeah, he's been with me thirteen years, man. He's he's just phenomenal. He's so soulful. Yeah, I mean anyone who's heard Ira Friedman knows that. You know, and he's great. He teaches piano up in Berlin at his house too. So if people are looking at piano lessons for the kids or for themselves, you yeah. should look Ira up. Um. Rest of the boys. Yeah, Brett Hoffman on drums, my longtime drummer. He played with me for like 13, 14 years. Gary Lotspeech on bass. I played off and on with him since 99. He's also from the kingdom. That's another one that Chad's telling me i got to have on the show. Yeah. Those guys are all keep, great. They've played around going. forever. Gary Lotspeech, he moved out here. He was a hippie from California. He did the reverse hippie commute, where instead of moving to California, he moved from California to New England. <laughs> he and a bunch of people, they started like a little communal housing thing up in Marshfield. And he was in a band called the White Hearts. It was like a bluegrassy kind of country band, I think, okay. back in like the early 70s, yeah, mid-70s. Uh, let's see, who else? So we had a three-piece horn section, the Mo Sax Horns, featuring Joe Moore. Uh, they call him Joe Mofo. That's why it's the Mo Sax Horns. Yeah. <laughs> he was Joe Moore. Uh, Jessica Friedman, Ira's wife, um, great, fantastic sax player. She played baritone on the record. And then um, Terry Yauk lives in Montpelier. He's a filmmaker, and he ran the Savoy Theater for a while. He's, he used to play with Sandra Wright. Yeah. You know, oh, Sandra Wright, the yeah. great soul, blues, band. soul yeah. blues, rock singer from Ludlow. So the three of those guys on horns. And then we had uh, April Kasparri. She lives up in the uh, Newport area now. She's an art teacher, but she's a great singer. She had a band called uh, The Tender Senders. So we got her on vocals, background vocals. And then Morgan Clarich, who used to be in the band Demosia. So that was her family band growing up. And she sang background vocals, too. She's fantastic. She's, she's from uh, Versher, Vermont. Beautiful town. I'm not sure where Versher is. It's out near me. It's out near you, right? Yeah. Somewhere out there. Wow, man. So then, a couple of years later, two years later, you got another one. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the, then that after that was uh, Every Soul's a Star. Yeah. And uh, those other records helped me get a record deal for Every Soul's a Star. So I was on Cat Food Records. I'm still on Cat Food Records. Technically, we just haven't released anything since then yet. What's that like? Will. What's that like? Well, it's nice to have to not have to do all the arranging stuff myself. I got to yeah. tell you, man, it's a lot of work to put out a record. I mean... I once had a kid come over who wanted to learn what it's like to be a musician and a recording artist for like a school project. And when I started listing all the different skills that I've used and developed to yeah. this, I was like, oh my God, this actually is a resume. 
you know, because I've always, my, my resume is a joke. I never worked anywhere longer than a year and a half other than being a musician. But, um, you know, you got to, you got to be able to write, you know, to write press releases and promotional sure. stuff. And oh, yeah. Graphic stuff for posters and, you know, sales stuff, like, so communication stuff. Yeah. All that stuff. Um, you know, organizational skills, songwriting, you know, the playing the instrument, singing, managerial skills with the band. Yes. Uh, driving and stuff. There's a lot of that. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of different stuff. Yeah. But I don't know. But what was my point? I had a point. But yeah, it was so nice. It was nice to be on a record label so that I didn't have to be the one sending out all the records to DJs yeah. and finding, making an arrangement with uh, distributors and all that stuff. And this, this is so, yeah, they did a great job for me. They really did right by me. And they hired a great producer, Jim Gaines. Are you familiar with him? No. So this guy produced, he produced Stevie Ray Vaughan's last record, In Step. He produced Luther Allison's comeback records on Alligator. He was the the uh, the main mix engineer for Steve Miller's classic material, like Fly Like an Eagle. He kind of gave Steve Miller his sound. He produced Huey Lewis in the News, Tower of Power. Tower of All these power. classic people. And, and <laughs> once he produced Steve Ray Vaughan, um, then all the blues cats, blues rock cats started knocking on his door. So he's, he's in his early 70s now, and he only does like four projects a year. So to get to work with him was a real honor. I'm just, uh, I can't help it. Um, yeah, man. You know, I'm, I'm listening to you, and I got this this pen in my hand, and yeah. I'm just taking all kinds of notes here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, Am I talking too fast? I told you. No, I grew man, up in Massachusetts. I can't help it. It's crazy. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just trying to, you know, I got things popping into my head here. Yeah. I just wrote down Andy Shapiro. Did you do anything with him? You know, okay. The, my only connection with Andy Shapiro. Well, I've oh, I'm sorry. My only connection, two connections with Andy Shapiro, is I play at the Andy Shapiro Memorial Bandstand in Middlesex yes. frequently. It's super cool. Yeah. His name's on that. Beautiful. But um, when I when I told you earlier, when I worked as a Kelly girl, Kelly Temporary uh, Services employee for Johnson State College, okay. um, Matt McLe Matt McLean, who lives up in um, Maple Corner in Callis, yeah, he yeah. was hiring acts to play up there for the student body, you know? Yeah. And he hired the Disciples, which oh, featured yeah. Tammy Fletcher yes. and Andy Shapiro on keyboards. Interesting. And I opened for them. I did a solo opener. And uh, so that that was my connection with him. And I was just like, wow, they were a great band. I mean, he was a great gospel artist, you yeah. know, soul. What about Cat Wright? Cat Wright, we've communicated a little bit and, and met each other and chatted and stuff. We haven't done any performing together. We talked about it a little bit. She's really cool. She's a really nice gal. What was it like at the fort? At the what? At the fort. Oh, at the fort, live at the fort. Yeah. Um, it's cool, man. I mean, that room is. You, you're talking about up at v, uh, v, VPR. VPR Studios. Yeah. 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 It's crazy, man. I mean, that is a really top-notch facility. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have to get some heavy donors to like turn this into that, I guess. But um, it was beautiful, man. They're really nice people to work with. Uh, the video stuff—they've got m automated cameras that follow you around. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And the sound was great. They're all really nice. It's just random stuff that's just it's just coming off. The top yeah, of my I have head. a link to that when I record up there. I have a link to one of those. I've seen it. To that on my website, just it's at dateskeller.com slash video. You can watch that. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Thanks. Um, that's with all my Vermont band, the the nine piece. I think it was late '90s mm -hmm. that um, that I got a chance to see Merle Saunders hmm. when he was coming through. And he stopped off at Club Toast. Oh yeah, Do you that remember was a cool the Toast? Place. Yeah, sure, Club Toast. That Did was you ever like a that was like more the, the indie rock place, yes, right? It was. The alternative kind yeah. of thing. Did you? Ever I was get more a of a metronome kind of guy. Metronome, because yes. that's where they brought the blues and soul people. Yeah, man. Yeah. Did Although get... I did see I did see Taj Mahal and Bo Diddley at Club Toast. Wow. Yeah, they were both great. Did you ever see Merle? No, I'm not. I mean, I've heard of him, but I'm not that familiar with his yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, and and I heard you earlier mention uh, Tower of Power. Oh my God. Yeah, I love Tower of Power. You know, I, I love that guy. Um, what's what's the guy's name? The main, Lenny Williams, the singer, who was on a lot of their classic stuff, like What Is Hip. What Is Hip? Um, yes. That guy's such a great singer. I recently bought a compilation of his stuff. I really dig his singing. He's on a really cool album by um, Betty Wright with the Roots backing them up, backing her up. She's a soul singer from back in the day, and you know the Roots. Yeah. You know, Quest Love and all those guys. Yeah. So Quest Love produced the record. It's called um, Betty Betty Wright the Movie. I think it's kind of funny. It's not a movie, I don't know, but and and uh, Lenny Williams from Tower Power does a guest spot on one of the songs on it. It's so cool, it's so cool. What do you um, 
what kind of festivals have you done? And I know that's a huge it's a huge sure. question. Yeah, yeah. There's there's so many. You could play all over the Northeast. Yeah. You run down to Boston. You're running all over the place. all over the country, man. You, you've yeah. done the Do Good Fest, yeah. Discover Jazz Festival, uh, yep. umpteenth times. Yeah, a lot. Uh, the North Atlantic Blues Festival. That's the biggest blues fest in New England, man. It's a real honor. I'm playing there this summer as part of Johnny Rawls' Soul Review. Whew. Yep, it's uh, July 11th. Yep. Do you ever get down to uh, Newport Jazz Fest at all? Or? I haven't. No, no, I haven't played in Newport. I played in Rhode Island a bit. Yeah. Yep. But you got some big stuff on the horizon, brother. I'm you're pretty gonna, psyched. I yeah. can't believe that you're here tonight because you. You've got a lot of planning that's going on right now. Here we are in uh, the end of February, mm -hmm. and you're going to be dropping the clutch here real soon in March. That's right, man. I'm going to put some miles on What's the What's going beast. on? What's yeah. happening? Well, let's see. In March, March 12th, I'm headed out to do a tour of the south. Uh, the sort of the farthest point <clears throat> is uh, Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Whoa. Yeah, we're playing in Muscle Shoals, man. That's where a lot of soul music started, exactly. Candy Staten recorded there. Oh. Percy Sledge, When a Man Loves a Woman. Uh, wait, a minute, wait a minute. Hang on. What was the Candy Staten song that I loved so much? Um, There's a lot. I recorded oh, uh, no, this is gonna Heart me. on a String. I did that on one of my albums, and that's on the new one. Um, that's gonna yeah, Hearts Run Free or something. That's no, a big hit. No, that's not the one I'm thinking of. I'd rather be an old man's sweetheart than be a young man's fool. That's oh, a good one. Man, what is that? Evidence. That's a great one. No, keep going. All the, all the classic stuff from like the late 60s, early 70s in Muscle Shoals is just amazing. I mean, I don't... Uh, Stand By Your Man, she did a cover of that one. That's cool. You know, this is going to drive me crazy all night. There's uh, a Candy Staten song from the late 70s. Things. The late 70s, maybe disco almost. Because she had a disco career. She yeah. had a gospel career after that. She had her own gospel channel, I think, or program. Yeah. I'm going to have to Google it. Yeah. All right. Um, but well, anyway, I'm, yeah, so, I, yeah, I love, I love Shoals, that voice. Yeah. God, Muscle I know, right? Shoals. Well, Man. the story behind that, her voice, you know, was uh, Rick Hall, who was the producer down in Muscle Shoals, the main producer, classic stuff at Fame. Um, he would make her sing. He would make her sing like tw the song twenty five times, do twenty five takes of the vocal, and then he would hit record. <sighs> he would just basically wear her out to where her voice got real raw. And when she found out he was doing that, she was really upset. Isn't that I would be upset. You know, like you're giving it your all each time, thinking yeah. you're being recorded, and then you're not even being recorded. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. She, who, who else? M so Muscle. Arthur Alexander. Okay. He's one of my absolute favorites. I could play an Arthur Alexander tune for please, you. Please, if, if you would. Please. I'll play my please. favorite, favorite tune to play at my solo gigs. Oh, uh, Arthur man. Alexander. So a lot of people obviously know Percy Sledge, When a Man Loves yeah. a Woman, yeah. right? And Out of Left Field, all his classic songs. He was the first one I ever really you know, really big hit out of Muscle Shoals. But before him, the one who actually had the first hit was Arthur Alexander, who the Beatles, like John Lennon said, he wanted to be Arthur Alexander. <sighs> yep. The Rolling Stones covered his stuff. Like, he was inspiration to a lot of people. He was just a stand-up singer. He wrote his own songs, but he didn't play an instrument. And he went on the road and just didn't do well on the road. I think he got in fights or maybe had a drinking problem. I'm not sure. And he disappeared for a long time. And they discovered him in, like, Cleveland or somewhere. Um, working as like a bus driver and like a janitor for like a youth services home or something. And they, uh, he didn't want to make any more music. He was like, I'm done with that. That's like, that part of me is, that part of my life's over. And he was like in his 60s probably. And they said, well, how about we just make a record and you don't have to tour or anything, you know? And they finally convinced him to do a record. And it's an awesome, awesome record. It's called uh, Lonely Just Like Me. It came out, I think on Nonesuch maybe, back in the mid 90s. And then he did a few gigs to kind of promote it, just a few, and he friggin' had a heart attack on tour. And that was it. That was it, his comeback. So sad. Thank God, though. Yeah. That he got to play. Yeah, right? I guess, but maybe he would have been happier to live a longer life, you know? And, I mean, you know, we Six assume. Six young man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this song was on that record, that comeback record's called If It's Really Gotta Be This Way. I just love this song. If it's really gotta be this way Go ahead, girl And do it Doesn't make a lot of sense to me But if it's what you want 
I'll live through it Well, I'll cry I'll get by And I'll forgive you Girl, by and by I'll forget you someday If it's really gotta be this way If this is what you think you need Go ahead, girl mm, Try it It doesn't make a lot of sense to me But if it's what you want Oh, I'll buy it Well, I'll cry I'll get by I'll forgive you, darling, bye-bye And I'll forget you someday If it's really gotta be this way In my heart There'll always be a place for you Could have made it, you and me. Dave Keller, Killer Guitar Thriller is his new album that is out. It's at Bookspieler. It's going to be here in Barrie over at Exile on Maine. Uh, man, dude, you just giving me goosebumps, old feller. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks, Damn. Jimmy. I appreciate Damn. it. Damn. Unknown Blues Band. Did you ever do any stuff with them? Well, I did. Fancy you should ask. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got to front them i've gotten to front them a few times since big joe passed they've done a few different gigs and benefits and different things and they called me up and asked me if i would sing some of big joe's old tunes and i was totally honored <coughs> you asked me before the show if i'd gotten to play with big joe or anything and i never did you know I, I got to meet him that was about it but you know i i wasn't that well known back then and i wasn't honestly that good back then you know so it's taking me i'm one of those people that took a long time to kind of build their skill set you know some people start off like uh prodigies or real talented when they're younger i wasn't really that was not me shall we say yeah you know i did my learning on the bandstand over many thousands of gigs shall we say um while you were playing yeah um i got that uh candy staten song it's oh he called me baby oh he called me baby Ooh. that's and a patsy, great song patsy patsy klein did it too did she do that oh that's cool did an incredible uh, yeah, I don't know that one. Take of that. You call me baby. Mm. Yeah, that's a great song. What a great tune. She's still alive. Candy Staten's still out there. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't do much touring. She, I think she mostly just goes over to Europe a couple times, maybe. Yeah. And uh, do you ever know, select get into, gigs. Do you ever get into a little bit of Phoebe Snow at all? I haven't listened to any Phoebe Snow. I should check her out. You I mean, I've heard to, the name. Yeah. You need to check out Phoebe Snow. All right, all right. I, have to write I, that I promise after. you. You check out Phoebe All Snow, right. and I'm checking out uh, Joe Moore and... Arthur Alexander, man. Arthur Alexander. That's my homework. Yeah, check out that comeback album, it, um, uh, Lonely Just Like Me. That's my favorite of Arthur's stuff. Yeah. Red Hot. Yeah. Festivals. The other festival that, uh, that we missed that um, you and I were chatting about before the cameras went on was the... Ben and Jerry's oh, One World, One Heart yeah, Festival. Yeah, that was it's a great a festival. Up in Waitsfield. It was a sugar it? bush, yeah, sugar for bush. years and years, yeah. At Mount Ellen. Mount Ellen. Yeah. The one I went to, I think uh, it was Hootie Mount, and the Blowfish yeah. was playing at the one I went to. Oh, really? I missed that one. Yeah. Yeah. 
I caught the one. I played at the one with uh, <coughs> with Storyville. Okay. Which was a great band. They had the rhythm section of Double Trouble. You know, Steve oh, Ray Vaughan's old rhythm unreal. section. Unreal. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, what else do you need to know? <laughs> Memphis Horns. I'm thinking about them. Uh, Tower of Power. I mean, the, you know, you know what's weird is that um, my mom. I think I was maybe seven or eight years old, and my mom went to a garage sale, a tag sale, okay. and came back with a cardboard box with some albums in it. Nice. And there was some Elvis in there, yep. uh, some Patsy Cline, and Memphis Horns, nice. and uh, Tower of Power. Nice. And I had, the, I had the turntable in the bedroom, and I put on uh, Tower of Power. Never had even heard. I think I was like seven or seven mm -hmm. or eight years old. I'd never even heard of them and dropped the needle on what is hip and that was that was it for and me. And that man. is hip. That was it. I yeah, was like, cool. oh my They're God. They're so tight, man. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's yeah. incredible. I don't know. You'd have to just, it's like James Brown, man. Like, you know, the only way to get that tight is to yeah. practice for ungodly amounts of time and have like a taskmaster just like, you know, making you do it because sure. there's no way to get that tight otherwise, I don't think. Yeah. I'm practice. not that much of a taskmaster, unfortunately. I can't really. Uh... Practice, practice. And, and I'm sure that's what you tell your students. You, you're, you're, you're teaching. You, mm -hmm. you, do some, you do some private teaching yep. right here in Montpelier. At Montpelier, my house, yeah. yeah. So I've always had, a, you know, I always had like a few students back in the 90s. And then when I uh, started having kids, you know, I've got two, two daughters. Yeah. I uh, wanted to be around for them more. So sure. my next door neighbor, Bob Blaze, uh, is a great cellist. He, he was teaching cello out of his house. And. I, he was like, why don't you just teach guitar, you know? Yeah. I was like, well, you know, I don't read music. He's like, well, most people learn guitar. I don't care about that. I'm like, well, I didn't go to music school, you know? Yeah. He's like, no one really cares about yeah. that if yeah, you're learning of guitar. Course. Like, of course. Everybody knows who you are. Just, you know, put out a shingle. So I started doing it and started with a few students. I ended up with, you know, 35, 40 students after a while. And I've scaled back since then just because I'm traveling more. But yeah. I still have some students, yeah. Good luck on this uh, on this tour. How many months are you going to be around? April, April, you're going to be in Germany and Spain. Yeah, that's crazy, dude. I know, right? Literally, uh, this club, really nice blues club in Baden Baden, which is like a resort town. It's a spa town in the southwest of Germany. They saw a review of one of my records in Blues News. It's the big German blues publication. Who's my, going with you? Uh, Ira and Jay. My that's my regular band right now is Ira Friedman on keys and Jay Gleason on drums. We're not using a bass player right now. We're just doing a trio with like a, like an I organ trio setup where Ira covers the low end with the, yeah. with the keys. I hope these countries are prepared for Dave Keller. Well, I don't know. We'll see, right? They're going to know where Vermont is. I'm going to sure. tell them where Vermont is. You damn you darn right. Well, darn well. I will. When I go down to Memphis and down south, I always tell them where Vermont is because people down there don't know where Vermont is. Yeah. I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. They're like, is it up like, uh, like what? Where is it? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I know it's up there in? somewhere. <laughs> what state is Vermont in? Yeah. Well, now that Bernie's out there, people know a little bit more about A little Vermont. bit more, yeah. sure. Uh, and then uh, in June is yep. when you run out west. Yeah, June we're headed out Midwest, so like out to Minnesota and back, basically. We did it last who, summer for the first time. It was really fun. Now, what's going on with the, uh, what's happening with the personal relationship here? Who are, are, are you married? What's going on? <laughs> what's going on? I'm not married. No, no, no. I've done that. I felt like, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going down that road again. Who are you with? Uh, I've got a great girlfriend, man. Katie Sterling. She's a, I don't know. I was going to say hot little <laughs> number, but it's the truth. I don't know how to say it without saying it. She's a great gal. She moved up here from Jersey a few years ago. Uh, we met at a blues festival down in, um, in the Poconos. I was playing with Johnny Rawls and my band, we were backing up Johnny, and she came to the festival. She wasn't really a blues fan or anything. Some friends of hers dragged her along who were blues fans, and she had just broken up with her partner, and uh, my girlfriend at the time, after first relationship after my divorce, had yeah. dropped me like a hot potato, and wow, we met the first night of the fest, and we've been together ever since, you know? We did the long distance thing for a year, and then uh, she moved up after that, and uh, yeah. What's next for you, bud? Uh, outside of these, outside of these tours, what what's after that? You got anything on the back side of that? You just gonna come home and another album? I can't believe I just described her as a hot little number. No, on, that's, in a, the that's public. fine. She'll actually appreciate that. I'm just ever so slightly embarrassed. <coughs> it sounds kind of like a sexist thing to say. She's a really smart and really interesting person. So she's there not just go. a hot little number. 
Well, you hey, we're live, man. So right. <laughs> you're, you're, you're airing it out. All right. It sounds well, like what did you ask lady, me? I was though. still thinking about that. What was your last question? Uh, what's after this? You're going to run around for a few months. What's on the What's on the back side of that? When you come back, a new well, album. I mean, I do have, I do have some guitar, some gigs up in Vermont that are coming up. I'm playing yeah. at Red Square in Burlington on the sixth of March. Wicked. And uh, and then on the 27th of March, I'm at Double uh, E in Essex. Yeah. You know Eric Koval, I'm sure. Uh, he's, he used to be a DJ at the point. I don't know Eric. Yeah, he's great. So his, don't know uh, Eric. Spe speaking of the point, yeah. that's a radio station that. We need to throw some love at man because they've done, oh, yeah. they've done you well. No, they've been nothing but good to me, man. You know, Zeb Norris was great, getting me on his show all the time yeah. and promoting whatever I had going on. Sure. Um, you know, uh, all those guys, Mike Luoma and Kerry yeah. uh, Henry, Kerry uh, Henry on the local thing. Yeah. The local spotlight on Sunday night. They're all really great. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I love DEV. WDEV has been great to me. Yeah, they are. From Jack Donovan to Artie yeah. Levine. Artie Levine. To, Levine. To now Greg Hooker is back there and Pitts yeah. Quattrone, obviously my Pitts. buddy. Yeah, They're all great. Them. And you yeah, were over there, yeah. yeah the one on one the one, you know? Yeah, one on yeah. one the one. And we, when you mentioned uh what was it, Buxton County? Bucks Bucks County. Bucks County. That's where Pitts is from, isn't it? He's from down that way, yeah. He's from yeah. outside Philly. Pitts or was on the Philly show. Uh, he's from not, the Philly area. Not long ago. So you've been up on you've shared a stage with him. We had a big benefit oh, yeah. for him yeah. at the Barry Auditorium. Yeah. Uh, God, I don't know when that was. Uh, last June. June. Last June. June, yep. It was right before I left for my tour, I think, yeah. Yeah, with Chad Hollister. Tell me about Chad. Give me some dirt on Chad. There's you, no dirt on Chad. Chad's you know a great he's watching guy. You right can't now. find any dirt on Chad. No, I mean, seriously, he's such a sweetheart, man. He is Who such... could hate Chad? He's so generous. He's, like, so loving. He's a great guy with his family. He's a great dad. He's a great partner yeah. to his, his wife. They're a great couple. What a songwriter, too. He's a great songwriter. And you know what I love about Chad? He's positive. Like, he's yeah. adding positivity and good stuff to the world. Yeah. He's not tearing anyone down. He's, he's like, trying to bring people together. Yeah. And not only is he a great guitar player and songwriter and singer, but he's a phenomenal percussionist. I mean, yes, that's was. his I'm original just instrument. started. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, so when I played with him at the Pitts Benefit, Pitts Quattrone's Benefit there, yeah. uh, he played drums with me. Yeah. And I had never played with him. As a drummer, you know, he actually just came over to my house, we rehearsed, and he nailed everything, you know, so it was great. Yeah. And it's on actually uh, on my uh, on my website at DaveKeller.com. If you go to the video page, you can see Chad playing with us. It's the yeah. very top video right there. What a great night that was. That I'll was never, a lot of fun. I'll never forget it. Backstage yeah. to hear you guys rehearse, and what was that closing song that you guys did? I can't remember what it was. That's but a good it was, question. It was amazing. Was it like... I don't know, Stand uh, By Me or something. I don't know. It was something like that. It was it was something that I would not have. I don't know, expected. man. I can't remember. But uh, oh, it was, it was Love Train. Love Train. That's it. it Love, was Love Train. Train. Uh, the OJ's. OJ's. That was a Philly band. Yeah. Yeah. People think they were named after OJ Simpson. No, they were named after some DJ from the Philly area named OJ. Yeah. Can you give me five seconds of of Love Train? Oh, you know, I don't know, boy. I used to know. I know I'm putting you on the spot, I, I don't, man. I don't think I can. You know? No. I mean, I could sing a little bit. People all over the world, join hands. Start a love train, love train. People all over the world, join hands. Start a love train, love train. Yeah. That yeah. was such a great night, man. And everybody was up. Everybody was up on their feet. Yeah. At the end of that night. Well, everybody, a lot of people love pits, you know. Yeah, man. It's nice, and that's the great thing about Vermont, too, is that there's community here. Yeah, sure. You know, like, you go out in the rest of the country, and, like, people are more isolated in a lot of places. Big time. You know, and our, our culture, I really feel like, separates people. Yeah. It's really competitive and really individualistic. Yeah. And right now, it's really, like, fear-mongering and really divisive. And, like, all of that just makes us unhappy and miserable. It's like... You know, we need, that's part of why music is so important right now and, and art and all, you know, writing and other things that like can kind of get people to get together, you know, like yeah. it's important for people to hang out and like go out and hear music. And I don't even care whether you talk while I'm playing. I'm happy for you to talk to your friends while I'm playing because people don't even see their friends hardly anymore. Sure. Everybody's working so much, trying to just get ahead, you know, not even get ahead, just trying right. to get by. We're spending time uh, texting. Yeah, yeah it's or good just to... on the computer at home. I mean, we think we're connecting through Facebook. I'm as guilty as anyone. But um, yeah, but you know, just going out, hanging out, having breakfast together, having a cup of coffee with a friend. You know, going out for a beer together. You know, calling up a friend and saying, "Hey, I haven't talked to you in a while. How you doing?" You know, that kind of stuff is so crucial. You know, and so yeah, it it does make me sad where we are as a society right now. I mean, I don't want to get too much on my 
you know, podium about it. But I do feel yeah. like, you know, it used to be that on Sunday, where would you find people? You'd find them at yeah. church, right? I'm yeah. Jewish, so I'm the last person you'd find in a church. Right. But the point is, people were hanging out together. Right. They were finding something spiritual Back at to Grandma's connect with. house. Right, and they'd help each other out if someone was down. They'd yeah. take a collection for them, right? Sure. Share a meal together. Now on Sunday, where is everybody? They're either at the mall or they're online shopping, right? Yeah. It's like the culture of buying stuff to make us happy. Right. But it doesn't work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Not you, for me, at least. I don't know. You can find Dave Keller everywhere. He is all over Vermont. He's all over the, the U.S. I don't know how you do it, man. Um, you got a crazy schedule, but... I don't know, man. I'm just... Uh, just trying. You know. DaveKeller.com. Find him on Facebook. Uh, shoot him a message. Tell him how much you loved the show tonight. And thank you. You can find my record online. Yeah. You know, you don't have to buy it. You can just listen to it online if you want. But yep. it's not streaming yet. I'm not streaming it just yet because yeah. I got a little, I'm not going to say a beef against Spotify and stuff like that, but it's just, it's right. the, the, the royalty rates are like yes, so small. I it's know. So small. It's like, it's. And you know, us as we as artists give them permission to use our music. Yes. So like we have no one to blame but ourselves. But you know, how many times you hear someone say, Well, I gotta put it on Spotify because that's how people are gonna hear it. And it's true, that's how people hear it. But you can't afford to make records and then just give them away on Spotify. Yeah. So I know. It's a real issue that someone's gotta figure out how to deal with it. And I know now we're in the digital age and everybody is used to getting things, you know, for really cheap. Sure. Like, you know, sure. Spotify for ten bucks a month, you have access to everything in the world. Who wouldn't want sure. that as a consumer? Sure. But people need to, I try to educate people that, you know, it doesn't cost nothing to make a record. It costs a lot of money, thousands and thousands of dollars to make a quality right. recording for the most part. You know? Right. Of Unless you're talking is. like indie rock or something. And, you know? and let's also say this. If there's a radio station that's playing local artists, yep. my God, please take five minutes out of your day. Take two minutes out of your day. Call that radio station yeah, right. and thank them. Yeah, yeah or send them an email or s put a post up on Facebook yeah. and thank them for supporting local artists. Yeah, that's true. Whew. Yeah, we need the whole circle. Like there's there's the people playing the music, there's people making it, there's the people recording it, engineering it, there's yeah. people promoting it, right. there's the club owners and the venue people, there's the arts councils, yeah. there's you, you know, people like who are promoting it online. Yeah. It's really, it's all important. So I, I'm grateful, man, I don't mean to complain because I'm, I'm lucky to have a career, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, as hard as I've worked, it's really just people keep coming out and seeing me and, you know, buying a drink or a CD or whatever and, you know, um, support me. So I really appreciate it. Anyone yeah. who's listening today, anyone who's come to a single gig or a bunch of gigs, bought a CD, yeah. giving me a kind word on the street, thank you. I loved I really catching it. you at uh, Sweet Melissa's, but I would love to see you on some bigger stages, man. You got the goods, brother. Thanks, man. You really, I really do, man. That. And Thanks. And, uh, I thank you so much for coming in here tonight, spending oh. some time with us, uh, bringing the goods to the listeners, to the viewers. Um, thank you again. Dave Keller. Thanks, J.D. Thank you. My great pleasure. Um, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, thanks to, again, our brand new sponsor. Isn't Lauren Andrews amazing? She used to be my neighbor. She's a great gal. Oh, yeah, man. I'm so psyched for her. She's doing so well with her business. Yeah, yeah. Aeromed Essentials, 25% uh, off of purchases from now through this weekend at all three of her locations, Dave. Uh, of course, State Street in Montpelier, uh, Berlin Mall in Berlin, and over on Allen Street in Hanover. Uh, again, 25% off purchases now through the weekend at all those locations, and she's gonna be on the show uh, real soon. I've got the uh, some real bad arthritis in both of my wrists. I'm yeah. having surgery pretty oh, soon. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll tell you, her uh, relief rescue, I think it's called rescue relief cream. I can't remember. But mm -hmm. it's her most popular thing yep. that she's got. And it's really the only thing that, that, that fights the arthritis for me. So wow. I can't wait to have her on the show. Of course, uh, Gothier's Quality Grounds and Maintenance. Uh, Jason Gothier, who is gearing up and tuning up equipment for spring mowing and spring landscaping already. Uh, despite all the snow out there. He's a busy plow guy, too. And Project Independence on Main Street in Barrie. What a show with them a few weeks back. You um, know I'm playing there. Yes, on the 26th, 26th of March. That sounds right. Yep. It's a Friday. Uh, no. Thursday, is it? It's a No, Thursday? it's a Friday. I know it's a Friday. Yes, grab your notebook. I got my book here, uh, man. I'm old it's school. a Friday, I and here. I'm putting my money on the 27th of March. That's what I think it is. Project Independence. You're correct. 27th. 1.30 to 2.30 on the 27th of March. Yeah. 
right on yeah. Barry. What, what right great people Barry. over there. Aren't they amazing? Yeah, they're really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. I always have fun playing there. Gosh, the people love you over there. They they're, do. Well, I love playing for them. Um, and Wright Electric, uh, Chris Wright uh, doing some sound tonight and helping out. And, of course, uh, Rich Lacomba uh, pushing the buttons tonight. Thanks, it. Rich. Thank you, thank you Rich, uh, so much. Uh, we're going to catch you uh, next week. I can't wait. Uh, more shows coming your way. Thank you for subscribing. Have a great night, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for checking out Aired Out.